All right, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome to our expert panel Q&A for the 2023 Makers of Change Assistive Technology Challenge. I am Luann Phillips. I am the Special Event Manager with Southwest Human Development and also the Program Manager for this amazing challenge. And we're really excited to have those of you who are on joining us. We are recording this and we will share it with the schools and uh, the teams who are not represented. But I did want to do um, just a little bit of housekeeping at the beginning. First of all, I want us to say thank you to our sponsors. For those of you who don't know, this um, program is sponsored by some really amazing uh, corporations within the Valley and that are um, worldwide. And so uh, just big shout out to these sponsors that we've got for being there to support uh, all that the students are doing. And then I also wanted to give a big thanks to our partner for this year's challenge, Foundation for Blind Children. And I'm going to stop sharing. And what I would love uh, for us to do is for each of our panelists to um, unmute and turn their cameras on. And I will just uh, call on each of you to just uh, give a quick introduction about who you are and what you do. And then we will get right into the questions. So I'm going to first start with uh, two members of the Southwest Human Development team that are on, uh, David Reno, and he is with the development department. He works with me and he actually was the one that founded this back in the day. Um, David, do you wanna say a few words? Just thank you everyone. We're so excited to share this challenge and see what the students come up with. and. Um, let us know how we can make it a rewarding experience and um, help kids like Z. Um, you guys doing the work is what it's all about. So thank you for uh, being willing to participate. Thank you. The next one up is Beth Rank. Beth, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Beth Rank. I'm the occupational therapist that works at the Southwest Human Development Adapt Shop. So excited to see all of you and hopefully answer some of your questions. And please reach out if you have any more that don't get answered tonight. Thank you. And then I believe we have two representatives on from Foundation for Blind Children. We've got Michelle Palmer. Michelle, can you introduce yourself? I'm Michelle Palmer from the Foundation for Blind Children with Jillian Salisak. She and I are teachers of the visually impaired uh, working in the early intervention program. Awesome. That's great. You're both there on the screen together. <laughs> Welcome. And then we also have uh, two members of our planning committee who are engineers and have an engineering background. One is Professor Schweib. He's with the ASU Engineering School. And I did see a note that he's only with us for a few minutes. So, uh, Professor Schweib, if you could just introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Abdurrahman Schweib. I'm a professor of practice in the mechanical engineering department at ASU, and I teach capstone design courses. I'm waiting for these innovators to join us in four years' time. And <laughs> I really mean, thank you for your efforts, and thank you for joining this meeting. I will jump out in a few minutes to go to my class at 4.30 okay. p.m. And if we have any questions that we can't answer that would be for your expertise, we'll go ahead and collect those and I'll follow up with you. Uh, please. Yeah. Okay. Super. Sure. Thank you. And then we've got Bill Harper and Bill is a retired engineer. Bill, would you like to introduce yourself? You there, Bill? I know he's there. Maybe he's having some technical difficulties. Well, he will be sure to jump in and he will give us some advice. He has many years of engineering experience and uh, he's also going to be serving as a judge and he's been on our planning team to help us get. Oh, Bill, it looks like you're muted. Well, we'll give you a, a, some time in a second, Bill. But uh, one of our most important guests that we have with us is Blair Kinsey, and she is the mother of Z. And uh, we have quite a few questions that she will be answering today because 
I'm sure as we at Southwest Human Development are just thrilled at, at this cute little guy, you all were probably so thrilled to meet him and learn about him as well. And so we'll learn some more tonight. Blair, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Blair Kinsey. I am Z's mom. Z is in here with me and he's oh. very loud. There's Z. Say hi, Z. Say hi. <laughs> hi, Z. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to, um, like I said, we received a lot of questions in advance. And so I thought we would start with those. I'm going to put those up on the screen and then any of you uh, on our panel who can answer those, please feel free to, though I know some of them are going to be um, more tailored to others. So I'm going to jump back to my share screen here. And so I think actually, um, Blair, these are probably going to be for you first because there's a lot of things here about um, Z's learning, his favorite activities, et cetera. So if you want to jump in and address these questions, that would be wonderful. Yes. Let me go back to your slide so I can see. Okay. Um, so how does Z learn fastest? And kind of um, what is his fastest method of learning? Those are kind of the same questions. So I would say he learns fastest by repetition. Um, sorry. I think um, we constantly say I love you to him all the time. And that was actually one of the first words that he spoke just by hearing us say it over and over and over. Um, so lots of repetition, uh, verbal cues, listening, listening to what we're saying, and then a lot of patience. He needs a little bit of wait time after we say something or ask him to do something so he can process it. And giving him that wait time is really important. Um, what is his favorite toy? So he loves anything that makes noise, that lights up, that has music, um, bubbles, fans. I have, if I can turn this around, I can kind of show you. He's very excited. Um, so he loves this piano toy. It lights up and it makes different noises. It makes animal noises. He loves this toy because it vibrates and then it makes noise or it um, lights up as well. He loves this little guy. It asks questions and sings songs. Um, and then he loves mu any musical instruments like the tambourine. And then he sits and plays on his drum all the time. Um, he loves this crinkle paper he has in his hand, anything that just he can touch and feel and that makes noises. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see. What other there, Did I miss anything? Um, oh, there we go. What tools grab his attention the most? Uh, tools meaning like toys? Probably or any, any you know, when he's curious, uh, I mean, is he curious whenever you're holding something in front of him? Does he try to reach for it? Or is, are there things that um, he's more drawn to than others? So he's definitely more curious when something makes noise. He won't initially just go to look at something because of his CVI. So something that either lights up or makes noise are going to get his attention much quicker um his favorite activity he loves all those toys I just shared but he also loves anything with water play bubbles loves the drums and musical instruments he loves to play peekaboo and he loves to copy sounds and beats so like if I tap three times on the drum he'll tap three times on the drum or I sing a little bit of a song and he tries to sing a little bit of the song. Um, 
And then I see what color is the least and most sensitive. So I, I stated previously, kiddos with CVI are usually drawn to red and yellow. The most important thing with Z is that with the colors is that it's not too busy or distracting. He works best with simple colors, something that's on a black background we always try the tray he's um using right now is black so that whatever we put on it there's a high contrast that's very helpful and just something that doesn't have too much going on at once um single colors are easier for him to see and process wonderful all right thank you so much for those i'm Here. sure there will be some others that I just wanted everyone to see his tray size so that everyone could see kind of what he's using currently. Um, Cause we might lose Z. He might decide he's had enough of our meeting. Can you um, Blair show us his tray again that he's sitting in? Yeah. So he is in his chair right now. The tray sits um, one foot off the ground. And obviously as he gets taller, it can move up. Mm -hmm. And then as he's reaching, I measured out about, it's about a foot that he can reach out here and easily grab too. Wonderful, thank you for that measurement. All right, let's go on with our questions here. Okay, speaking of measurements, we've got a lot of questions related to his measurements. Um, and uh, can I ask everyone to please make sure they're muted so that we can hear what uh, everyone is saying? And again, because we're recording this, we want to minimize any sound. So please, if you're not asking a question, if you could make sure you're muted, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Beth or Michelle, do you know Z's measurements? I Blair, did you take Z's measurements? Yes, I have them. So I have, I don't have the arm. His height is 33 inches and he weighs 23 pounds. Wonderful. Okay. And specs for Z's current devices and tools. Um, I'm going to ask whoever had that question to come off mute if they want and clarify what specifically you're looking for with that question. Um, okay, I think we'll move on then. Okay, so Blair, you said the measurements of the tray that is on his table, uh, it's about 12 inches from the back to front. So yes, from uh, it's about 12 inches from his torso to where he can reach out with his hands. It's 12 inches off the ground. And then I can measure how wide it is right now. Um, I think that he probably has about a square foot two of, feet. Yeah, I was gonna say he probably has like a square foot of play space in front of him. I would say, and yes. I think some of those communication buttons that we've used are probably like twelve inches across, and maybe the button space is maybe like two by two. Would you say, Blair? Yes, maybe a little bit bigger, but close to that. Yeah. Okay. And let's see, how tall is he? So we heard that he's 33 inches. Uh -huh. And uh, what are things that could potentially harm Z that we don't know about? Um, that's a tricky one. And I guess I would say probably those things that are around his environment that we don't know what could hurt him. Um, but I don't think uh, that there's anything that he interacts with in a, a on a typical day where there would be potential harm that would come to him. So we're going to move on to the next, which are quite a few, and um, hoping that Beth and Michelle can speak to these. 
So I know that there were concerns because in the explanation that we gave about his health, we did say that he has epilepsy and uh, we know that lights can sometimes trigger seizures. So could one of you explain um, whether the lights have anything to do with his seizures? Yeah, Z um, was tested by his neurologist and lights are not a trigger for him. So he is able to tolerate um, flashing and blinking lights. Um, his seizures are well controlled with medication. Um, and as of now, the family doesn't really know what triggers he has, but he, they're controlled. Okay. And just to speak on the dangers for him, the only thing that um, Blair and I were saying is that things that are, you know, sharp or um, really hard on the edges, because he does have some spastic spasticity. And so he does jump and then kind of flint. He also likes to throw. Uh -oh. So we just need to make sure that whatever he has doesn't have real sharp edges or, you know, things that he could accidentally throw at himself to, to hurt himself. Um, that would be the only concern. So, for harm. Okay. So at this point, there's no, there, there are no concerns with any type of a device that, or, um, system that would be created that could trigger the seizures? Not that we're aware of, no. Okay, yeah. And, and when we're asking questions about size, um, because he does tend to, you know, I think probably everyone saw in the video, he likes to chuck those buttons that we have, mm -hmm. the recordable buttons. Mm -hmm. um, whatever is designed and developed needs to be like solidly in place or have the ability to be um, well, anchored because he, he does, he is a fan of chucking things. <laughs> I noticed that in the video. He did that a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> um, can anyone speak to, uh, what might be limiting the use of his right hand and whether that is something that, uh, is permanent or is he, he's working on, I, I remember in the video, um, Fran did talk about the fact that, you know, there, there were different abilities on each side of his body, but we do have a question here about his, his right hand. Blair, do you want to answer that or? So oh, yeah, his, he, with his CP, he has limited mobility of his right hand. It's usually kind of balled up in a fist. But he, that's something we're constantly working on in PT is getting him to, we open his hand, getting him to grab toys, hold on to the toy, which he can, he won't do it for long periods of time because his right hand is not as strong, mm -hmm. but he does have limited mobility and he can grab things with it. He will grab for toys um, or hold toys for short periods of time, but it's just not his dominant hand. So I also noticed in the video that um, you were working to get his attention and grabbing with the right hand by squeezing some of that, um, the cellophane. Is there, are there any objects that motivate him to try to grab something with his right hand? Yes, um, things like the cellophane and things that make noise and are squishy that are easier to grab. Mm -hmm. um, he also grabs, he holds on really well to something like this. It's like, um, I don't even know what this thing is, but you pull it and it makes noise and it lights up and it kind of goes in and out. And so just something that fits right in his hand well that he can kind of grab like this, um, like a drumstick. He'll hold on to the drumstick and beat the drum with it. A lot of times we still have to guide his hand or do like hand under hand or hand over hand to help him but he will open his hand to hold on to something like this or something smaller that fits in the palm of his hand. Okay. Where does he ever use that accordion toy to, with both hands? Yep. Um, that's what we were actually just working on in therapy last week um, was getting him to hold it with both hands and we brought it back together and then he slowly pulled it apart. Okay. Thank you.
All right, I lost my place on the slides here. Okay, let's go to um, his development. And these questions, um, some of them, uh, I just want to encourage the students to look at the instructor guide, the student and instructor guide, because there are quite a few links in there to articles, to websites, and even a few videos about CVI. And I feel like uh, if you watched those, you would get some good reference. Um, but is there anything that you, top of mind, Michelle, Jillian, that are treatments that are typically used for those with CVI that you could share that don't have to go into a lot of detail? So I think we kind of talked about it in the video of sort of that there's phases of CVI. And um, I think a lot of the references that Luann is referring to in the um, handout was really good information about CVI. But um, what is important to know, I think, is that he's kind of in that moving into that phase two of CVI, which involves him starting to use his vision to affect change. Um, so the strategies that we have in place are, you know, um, the some of the things that Blair talked about were like eliminating a whole bunch of visual clutter, leaving, you know, things that are one or two colors, um, eliminating background noise kind of to allow him the time to sort of process and then giving him some good wait time um, to visually uh, attend to the items that are in front of him. Um, that's kind of where he's at right now. So would you say for the three skills, what are the top three skills like for cause and effect, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, building. So the building skills is he's been working on cause and effect, uh, choice making and, um, cause and effect, choice making. turn taking. That and was turn taking. One. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so he's doing really well. The example Blair gave with the turn taking is, um, you know, him scratching on that drum and, them going back and forth. Um, he has a lot of switch toys, or well, not a lot, he has a few switch toys that he can activate, which is the cause and effect. And then the choice making, I think you saw in the video where we were giving him an option for a toy versus a cracker. Mm -hmm. um, so those are kind of the things that we've been working on uh, in therapy. Okay. And what what are his abilities at this stage of his development in terms of learning? Um, I, I know, again, this is a progression, uh, but do you have any specific um, information you can share about his, his cognitive abilities at this stage or his ability to take on new experiences or? Yeah, I mean, um... You know, the thing with CVI is it's neurological processing. So it's hard to know sometimes, like, does he see and understand what he's seeing or is he just seeing? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big part of kind of weeding that out. Um, and that's why we have all those strategies in place for repetition and giving him good wait time, th those kind of strategies to help him. Um, Blair, what would you say in terms of, you know, I, I mean, we're working on motor for sure. We're working on the language piece um, and then just the visual attention, I think are his three most important development pieces right now. And to ask the question, what is he capable of? I mean, I think that's unlimited. We just, we don't know, you know, we're, we're working on all the strategies that, that we can right now. And he is making progress. Um, but as far as cognitive capability, there's no way of predicting, you know, in his future, what he'll be able to do. Okay. Do you have any ideas on what is appropriate for building his motor skills? Well, I mean, we're working, he's, you know, starting to roll. Uh, we're working on sitting. He's actually getting a lot stronger for sitting in therapy. The other day, he was just barely supported at the hip and was staying up for quite a while. Um, Blair? Beth, what else would you say on that one? 
I think he's getting close to standing too, isn't he? Standing with some support, Blair. Sorry, yeah. He is tolerating the stander a lot longer when he's in his stander. Um, and then with me guiding like at his waist or if he's standing against something like on our ottoman at home and he's leaning up against the ottoman he is getting stronger and closer to standing definitely still needing quite a bit of support with the standing um sitting he's slowly starting to get a little bit more independent and then he's really interested in the rolling over and trying to get to objects that he hears or that he can see to reach them that's probably where he's at most right now with that rolling phase Okay, thank you. I would just add that some of the magic with helping Z is sometimes it's supporting his body so that he doesn't have to use all of his muscles to be able to sit. So sometimes we want to give him support so he doesn't have to think about sitting up and so he can focus on maybe what his eyes are doing or what his hands are doing or what his mouth is able to do. So it's a it's it's not all or nothing with the mobility it's you're supporting sometimes sometimes you're challenging the mobility but maybe you're not asking him to do so much with his eyes it's just putting all those pieces together is really challenging for z mm -hmm. right and i think that's a good answer to the last question beth like how do different dif disabilities affect people with cbi um you know there's so many components like the cp um expecting him to look and reach and motor plan all at the same time and then also he's not communicating right now verbally so um like michelle said really have to decipher and watch his behaviors to find out is he really seeing and understanding what he's looking at or is he just looking so um kind of how all of his disabilities are intertwined and figuring him out Okay, thank you. Let me pull up our, I think we've got one last set of questions. And these questions do more with the challenge and the engineering process. So I would like to ask um, Bill Harper, I. I did see you, I saw your face on there. Um, if you're able to unmute and give us a quick introduction of your background, and then if you have any thoughts for answers to these questions, that would be great. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I finally figured out how to work my iPhone. You know. <laughs> I'll get into the 21st century soon. Uh, uh, again, my name is Bill Harper, I'm a retired engineer. Pretty well, I worked on uh, aerospace systems for about 50 years. Um, and I'm not sure, I've not seen these questions before. Um, so I'm not sure those are so much um, engineering questions as they are um, functional practical questions. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, I mean, we've seen his chair, which gives a, uh, which is a fairly large device. I would think that would be sort of a limit or, or the approximate size that you want to put at the maximum size, just for practical reasons. Um, and, and the limit for complexity, it, it all depends on what complexity you're talking about. If I think we've discussed pretty well the uh, limit on complexity for his visual and for his touching. Um, but I wouldn't think there'd be any limit on complexity within the um, budget guidelines, any limit on complexity of the support system that provides that input to him. So from a standpoint of his input, I think that's been covered pretty well. From the standpoint of the backup machinery, um, as complex as you think you need to make to be practical and to provide the uh, uh, sensory input that you want to provide. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, that was the list of questions that we had submitted uh, prior to this session. I'd like to now open it up and ask if you have a question to please try to be as specific as you can. 
Um, but if you would like to come off mute or uh, turn on your camera and ask a question, any of our uh, experts here, please do so. I'm also looking at the questions that were put in the chat. So the measurements of the chair table and how does the table attach to the chair? Um, Blair, are you able to show us one more time the seat that uh, Z is in? Uh-huh. Okay, let me turn around. The tray kind of slides into a slot. Like if you look at the very back, there's a wood, wood back to it. And the tray just slides in those slots. And then in the front, it kind of sits, there's like a, a doubled up wood piece that sits, that kind of nestles in itself. That makes any sense. Yes. Can you... So there's a support in the back, how it just goes into the wood. And then under it, like right in front of his knees, there's another support that it kind of fits into like a and are his feet what are the what are the um they the look blocks. like pedals almost what are those in front of his feet so sometimes um kids with some spasticity tend to kick their feet out oh, okay. so we put those in there to give him kind of a, a force to push against so he doesn't kick his feet out and lose that stability got it thank you yep. um more questions about <laughs> motor skills well, this question is, what are some motor skills you would like Z to learn? And I know he's working on standing, sitting, he's able to roll. I mean, is that right now, would you say that the standing and sitting are probably the biggest or also maybe that uh, the ability for his right hand to have more mobility or movement? I think, I mean, any and all of those, those are all things we're working on. Those are our big goals in therapy is getting him to use his right hand and right side of his body. And then the sitting, the sitting piece. So toys that keep him engaged and entertained while he's working on sitting. Um, and then the standing piece too. Okay, thank you. Blair, I might just add, like, as we're advancing him with communication devices, you know, things are big right now. And we are talking about big movements with his hands. But eventually, if he can get down to using like one finger to point, he's going to be much more effective with a communication device because he's going to be able to select smaller objects on a screen. So, I mean, just thinking forward, that's kind of where it would be nice if Z had that much control of his whole body so he could get to the point that he could use like a single finger to select something. Uh, here's an interesting question. What type of texture should we avoid? Um, Michelle, can you think of anything off the top of your head? I don't think there's anything that he really doesn't like every now and then um I mean I don't know what we would do with slime or anything but sometimes when we're at events slime that slimy texture kind of turns him off he just doesn't really enjoy it but there's no real textures that he loves anything with texture anything that's soft anything that's bumpy anything that crinkles there's nothing really that I think we would need to avoid okay great um let's see are there things that upset him? Um, there's a couple toys that we have that make really loud, strange noises, and he doesn't he doesn't like them. Um, sometimes noises like the vacuum or I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I don't think there's anything. Most noises he thinks are funny. Like when the fire, the smoke detector goes off in our house, if it's testing, he laughs at it. When you, he loves like tin foil. And when you're putting the garbage bag in, okay. like that noise that it makes. Um, so it's really random things that he doesn't love. He really likes anything that makes any type of noise or music. Okay. 
Wonderful. Um, there's a question about the um, seat that he has. How much bigger can he be and use that seat? Like how, how much more can he grow into that? Or at what point is he too big for it? And would he move to a different type of device? Beth, do you want to take that one? <laughs> I think he's got a couple inches at least in that seat because if you had looked at when we were looking at the back of it, it's those all those little marks on the back would be a way to make the tray oh. higher. And so, and then he's sitting kind of on a post that I think we also made it so it raised up as well. So he's got some growth in that seat. Um, as far as what Z will go into next, it depends a little bit on how he does with his mobility. If he's gonna, you know, go to a wheelchair or what we're going to use to get him back and forth to preschool. Um, but that's something still to be determined. Thank you. Um, let's see. What does a typical day in the life of Z look like? Mom? <laughs> yes. So um, Z typically wakes up around 6 or 6.30. He has breakfast. He has four siblings we have um z and then we have two six-year-olds a 10-year-old and an 11-year-old so he spends a lot of time being entertained by them and playing with them they usually help um feed him in the morning then he gets dressed we two days a week he goes to daycare to interact with other kiddos and then and is Every that a foundation for the blind children? Not yet. Right oh. now, that is at Upward Foundation. Okay. We're hoping in just a couple, in a month when he turns three, that he will be joining Foundation for Blind. Um, And then the days he doesn't go, we do therapy. We have swim therapy every Monday. We do swimming at Hubbard. Um, we do physical therapy. We do vision therapy. And then I just try to get him out in the community and interacting with other kiddos and doing other things as much as possible. Friday, we have a play date with Foundation for Blind. We're all going to Gymboree. Um, So as many activities like that as possible, then he does take a nap. He'll take like a two hour nap in the afternoon, um, plays with his siblings and he's a hit in our neighborhood. All the kids love to come over and play with him. And then just a normal like dinner bedtime routine. He'll eat dinner with us as a family. He takes a bottle and then goes to bed usually around 730. And do you read to him before he goes to sleep? He loves reading. Um, we usually read around, like right after dinner time. Bedtime is usually the lights are off. He's taking the bottle, the sound mm -hmm. machine's on. He likes it really quiet. But mm -hmm. um, I, he does love the books, especially like the touch and feel books. And he's getting pretty good at turning pages of books. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so here is an interesting question. What kind of therapy or devices helped him move from phase one to phase two? So uh, the strategies for CVI um, in terms of moving from one phase to the next, the early on in his phases, he wasn't really looking at much visually at all. So we worked on all the strategies that include eliminating, you know, so much of the background. He played in the little room that you saw in the video um, with just a couple of items for him to just learn to look and use his vision and, and to see light. Um, and now that he's in phase two, he's really using his vision to uh, create or affect change. So the video that you saw with him um, activating the switch toys, you know, it's a communication device. Basically, he was making the choice between between two items. Um, and so in phase two, the device that we're hoping that you'll create is something along those lines where he can visually look at it and then activate something uh, to create some type of change. Uh, we're working on using uh, concrete items. And then eventually when he is able to look um, and reach for those kind of concrete items, then we move from you know the 3D into the 2D. So 
something where, you know, he could start to, you know, match like a red ball and then a picture of a red ball, that kind of a thing. Um, Thanks on that one. Yeah, no, that's great. You did a great job. And this isn't a question, but I, I think it might help with just um, like time span. How long has he been in vision therapy? How long has he been receiving vision therapy? Mm, in terms question. of months. How old was he? Well, he, I started talking to you. He was six months old. Okay. And we started pretty much right after that. And he's about can to turn three. Can we go to Violet's house? No. Oh. All right. Um, did did you feel that he moved, Michelle, that he moved through phase one fairly quickly? Or did it take about a year for him since you said he's now just kind of into phase two? Yeah, it, I mean, it took him a while. And, you know, every kiddo is different. He does have a lot of motor stuff going on. And so sometimes when you're working super hard on motor, then the vision kind of falls by the wayside. So, um, I, I mean, he's doing a great job, I think was the question what was the specific question? How, how quickly he moved? Well, my, it was my question that I actually okay. asked, like how, how long had, was he in phase one? I, again, I, I think it would be helpful for the students to know, you know, how, I guess how quickly he's moving through these phases. And so that's why I, we didn't say in the information we provided what age he was when he started mm -hmm. and knowing now that he's almost three, um, it sounds like most of it has been in phase one at this point. Yeah, he it, most of it's been in phase one, but now that he's got a little bit more motor control, so we, he's able to reach for those things, whereas before, you know, he was not reaching as much. So now we're seeing that reach and look kind of behavior, um, okay. which then gives us a better indication of like, oh, he definitely saw that because he reached right on target for that item. Uh, here, here are two questions that are similar to each other. Um, is he easily overstimulated and what's his attention span? Um, I, I mean, when we're doing therapies, it depends on what he's doing, honestly, with his attention span, he could, the other day he was in his stander for an hour just playing with the toys that I had on his stander for probably 30 minutes. And then I put a video on with nursery rhymes and he tolerated his stander for an hour. Now there's other times when we're in therapy and he's could be tired or something. And he wants each toy for maybe 30 seconds. And then he's, he'll kind of throw it. And that's our sign. He wants a new toy. So it kind of just depends on his mood and what we're asking him to do. Um, Have you ever just... seen him get overstimulated? Yes. So he really only gets overstimulated if they're like, when we've had people over at our house. My daughter's on a soccer team. And one time her entire soccer team came over um, to watch one of the world cup matches and he just got it was just way too much for him like there were too many people around the tv was on the kids were running around and he my husband just had to kind of take him into the bedroom and lay with him but he doesn't tend to get too overstimulated when it's in therapy or like playing with toys he's used to I mean we have five kids in our house mm -hmm. so right. he's going on all the time yeah okay thank you um is he able to communicate his needs or wants with any devices or signals at this point? He uses very basic sign language. He knows how to sign more. So, um, and he's starting to be able to kind of tell all done. So I can ask, do you want more? Or are you all done? Um, the communication board that we have in the video is helping us uh, communicate kind of what he wants as far as like we'll put two different toys the one that had the two buttons like yeah. do you want the drum or do you want the bells and then he'll touch the one that he wants that's definitely we're just in the beginning phases with him being able to do that um we'll make choices in the morning for breakfast I'll hold up to like do you want the waffle or do you want the yogurt just to encourage that communication and choice making piece but that's, he's at the very 
beginning of communicating. Okay. Are there any activities that he is restricted that are restricted for him due to his condition? Um, I mean, not really, obviously, since he can't walk things. Are, so like on Friday when we go to Jamboree, you know, there'll be kids that are climbing up the slide, but I mean, he's not restricted from that. I just have to help him. I always encourage him to still try everything. Um, we've even gone to like play places uh. like, um, kids empire and all I just have to go up there with him mm -hmm. but he always tries everything but obviously he can't do things independent so he is somewhat restricted but he can still with assistance do almost everything that other kiddos his age can his do age. Okay. yeah um we had a question about if there are questions through this process um, that the students have for Blair about Z, is there any way to communicate those? And I would say, if you have any questions, you are welcome to email me and I can pass those along to Blair. And what I would do then, in all fairness, is I would share those out with all of the teams because uh, we want you all to have the same information that everyone just, we need to make sure that everyone has the same information. So if you do have questions that aren't addressed tonight, or um, that you that come up along the way, please send those to me and I will do my best to get them answered and then get them out to all of the teams. Um, let's see, how far is his reach outside of the standard? So from my understanding, the standard is, it's two, it's like three poles, right? Um, yeah, it probably has like a central post and then a tr it has a tray similar to his seat. Oh, it so does I'm, have a tray. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's probably like no more than 12 inches, Blair. Okay. Right. All right. Let me see if I've missed anything. And please feel to chime in, all of you on Zoom, if I didn't address I just your question. One of the questions I see popped up is they're asking if having more than two choices would be too much for. Oh, right. And I think this is a good one for you to answer, Blair. Right now, yes, we're just working on making choices between two objects. Um, they don't always necessarily have to be in the same category. Like sometimes I'm trying to figure out, it, are you hungry or do you want to play? So sometimes I'll say, do you want a cracker or do you want the drum um and sometimes it is food like I know he's hungry and so I'll say do you want a banana or do you want a waffle um but right now I think two is probably the max choices okay um last question is a good one too would you would you like them to focus on fun or functionality with the project better? Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> both. I, mean, I think both. I mean, at this age, for any three year old kid, it has to be fun. If it's not fun, it's they're not going to do it. Um, I think that's an age thing, disability or not. So I think it has to be fun. Um, and so that's what we're challenging you guys to do kind of mix those two up for us and for Z. Um, there's also a question Does he prefer to move around or stay still? And that's a good one. I've only seen him a couple of times. It seems like he, when he's not in his chair, he he rolls. Um, yeah, he likes to move around. He likes to change positions. So like he can only toler tolerate being in his stander for so long. Then we'll go to his chair. Then he likes to play on the floor and roll around on the floor. Um, he'll like, he really likes to stand when somebody's holding him too. Like if I'm on the ground, holding him standing um so yeah he is he's a mover he likes to move all over the place and change from position to position uh there's still some questions about the seizures and i i just think um there's a little bit of confusion concern because i think we've all been conditioned to that uh, with lights, flashing lights and movement uh, that can exacerbate things. Is there any other 
thing that any of you can share uh, related to your knowledge about seizures in terms of why lighting is not impacting that for him? So he did a, a study in the hospital and they they provided all sorts of triggers and monitored his brain activity. They did all of, they did light, they did flashing light, they did all different toys, um, they did noises. And the entire time we were in the hospital, he didn't have a seizure. Nothing specifically triggered his seizures. Um, and with me, he's been with us since he was six months old, he's only ever had one seizure. We were in the car and I, I cannot think of anything that would have triggered it. He absolutely loves lights and flashing lights and noises. So it's deaf and he's never had a seizure. So it's definitely, the doctors have stated that it's not specifically triggered by the lights and the flashing okay. lights. All right. Yep. Okay. Um, can you, can Z understand basic words? Yeah, definitely. I mean, simple words, mm -hmm. um, but he definitely understands words that like I was saying earlier, we say, I love you. Mm -hmm. And he'll say, I love you. I'll say, can you give me a kiss? And he opens his mouth and gives me a kiss. If I ask for a high five, he knows high five. Um, Things that are routine to him, like, do you want to eat? He knows the word eat. He'll get very excited when he's hungry. Do you want a bottle? He'll say Baba, and he knows it's time to start getting ready for bed. Um, he knows bed, night-night or bedtime. He actually gets excited for that. <laughs> so words that are part of our everyday vocabulary that we use a lot with him, he definitely understands. Wonderful. Um, does he like to sleep? Does he, does he sleep? Is he a long sleeper? Oh, that's hit or miss. Um, <laughs> he normally he naps, he'll take about a two hour nap during the day and then he'll sleep from seven 30 or eight at night until about six o'clock in the morning. He does have, because of his CP, um, some tummy issues and constipation issues. So if that's a problem, Sometimes he's up quite a bit in the middle of the night. Um, he also gets Botox injections for his stiffness in his muscles. And so when he gets those every three months and when the Botox is starting to fade away and it's time for a new round of injections, he gets way more uncomfortable and fussy and tends to not sleep as well. Okay, that's good to know. Um, let's see. Can he recognize patterns? Patterns visually or yeah. I, I'm, I'm assuming patterns such as, you know, yes, patterns on that he would look at. Michelle, I mean, I don't, I don't think he can first, I can't say that for sure he can recognize patterns. How about this though? I think Blair, like if you had a button that was lit up and like half of it was covered in black, like at an angle, I think you would be able to tell the difference between that versus like a lit up button with a round circle in the middle. Like if they were to use black and black and lit, lit up contrasting things, I think he would be able to tell the difference between things. I think, what do you think, Michelle? Yeah, I agree. That's a great yeah. example. I think busy patterns are going to be too much, but I think your example was perfect. Okay. Um, there's a question. Uh, so there was a question about the stander and I see Beth um, sent a link to the stander in the chat. Um, and yes, this is all. We are primarily focusing on CVI and his vision goals. Um, physical therapy is happening at the same time, but what we're working on with this challenge are his vision goals. Um, are there any other questions related to the challenge itself? Um, anything about the requirements that you have? Uh, if not, I have a few reminder items that I wanted to share. And then we're going to go ahead and wrap up because we promised that all of our team that this would be an hour and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, 
So if there are any other questions, uh, let's see. So there's a question, are we making this for Z alone or for all that are affected by CVI? So the idea is that we are making this for all children affected by CVI, that what solutions you all come up with can be used by another child. Z is our scenario and uh, the, the child that we are, are working on a solution for, but there are many others that have CVI. Is that correct, Michelle? There are a lot of children with CVI. Yes, a lot. Okay. Um, would you like us to create something where he is sitting, standing, or something where he can lie on the floor and play? That is up to you all. That's something that you all have to decide on um, because we know that he's through all of this that was shared about Z, we know that he has the ability to sit and have a tray in front of him. He has the ability to stand and have a tray in front of him. And he also has the ability to be on the floor and roll and discover something that might be uh, on the ground with him. So it really, that is where your um, design and your thought process comes into play. That again, listen to what the video said, blue sky this, and then maybe come back to earth a little bit and say, okay, we've come up with all of these options. What do we think from what we've heard and what we understand about Z is going to work best for him? And it may look like any of those three things, but that that's all for you all to decide. Um, should the final design work right away and should we be building up to a skill with the design? Um, well, I. Again, uh, Z's growth and learning is a progression. Um, and I don't think that any of the final designs will quote work right away. Um, this is something that he is going to be developed, you know, whatever the device is, it's going to help him to continue to develop the skills he's working on. Those skills as choice making, um, what are our other skills? Choice making, turn taking, and creating change. Creating change. Thank you. Um, okay, I've just got a few little reminders here. Um, I wanted, we did have some questions about the stipend for supplies. And I did want to say that if you're going for a level two or three, there is a need for a stipend and supplies, and we can fulfill that. But if you are only in level one, there shouldn't be any need for materials. Um, most of what you would be doing would either be uh, through a computer program that you might have access to, or again, we said sketches um, can also be included. And then it would be more of uh, just typing that up and formatting it. But again, if you are going for level two and three, please uh, reach out to me so that I know if that's something that you know, we need to provide you with that stipend. Um, we also had several of you who pro provided mentoring times, and I will be sending out a reminder um, tomorrow to all of the instructors that if I don't have a mentoring time um, that was provided with the challenge application or you haven't emailed me, I will give one last opportunity to get that information, and then we will uh, work on creating our schedule based on what's been shared with us. And I think that's it. I just wanted to also let all of you that are on know, just for reference, because this is probably not something that um, you would know about, but we have a total of 18 schools participating in this challenge, and that is a record for us. So we are very excited. Um, and we, you know, we're, we're just excited that you have chosen to participate in this and, and work towards something that is going to help Z and again, others like him. Um, and let's see, <laughs> one more question. Oh, I think actually, Michelle, you answered the question um, about the position. Okay, I think that's it. Um, we did record this. I will make sure that I share a recording with those of you that are here as well as, uh, as, well as those that weren't. And again, if you have any questions that come up in the interim or you're confused about something on the challenge, please send me an email and I will address those, but I will be following up in the next day related to mentoring time so that we can start to line up our mentors. And with that, I will go ahead and say goodbye and thank you. And panelists, I hope you have a great night. And LZ, we said goodbye. <laughs>